Sonny Barger, the notorious and feared leader of the Hell's Angels, was actually a hell-raising hypocrite who relied more on his biker mystique than actual menace. This is a heavy claim, made by no one other than George Christie. We all know Sonny Barger as the longest-serving chapter president of Hell's Angels chapter, and with the title comes a variety of notorious crimes. He was a murder suspect and was convicted of drug trafficking and prohibited possession of weapons. In 1984, he became a paid informant for the FBI. In 1988, Barger was convicted of conspiracy to blow up the clubhouse of a rival motorcycle gang, Outlaws MC, in Louisville, Kentucky. But now there are new accusations made by George Christie, an American former outlaw biker and gangster who served as president of the Ventura, California chapter of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club between 1978 and 2011. While Sonny Barger was the club's reckless leader, George was the negotiator, the spokesman. You would say no one else would have known Sonny better than Christie. And although brotherhood is key in the Hells Angels and any other motorcycle club, George Christie has some new information about Sonny Barger, and these are pretty wild. He exposes his ex-boss as a snitch. In George's latest book, Exile on Front Street, My Life as a Hells Angel and Beyond, he spills the tea and shares information about a hard-hitting, action-packed life in the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. He takes us on an action-packed ride through his years as a Hells Angel, from the bloody brawl that started the war with the Mongols to learning that a contract had been taken out on him by the head of the outlaws. He describes the Brotherhood and the betrayals being targeted by the Feds. But more shocking, he also reveals how the club changed under the leadership of Sonny Barger and even calls him out on his bad behavior. But where is this all coming from? Take the first two allegations. Barger's call to the cops followed a domestic violence incident where he attacked his spouse, Noel, and her 14-year-old daughter, Sarah. Rumors were already flying that Noel was a paid FBI informant, but that wasn't the main reason behind the assault. According to Christie, Barger came home angry after Noel caught him riding with another woman on his motorcycle and tried to run him off the road. Against all the rules of the Hell's Angels about protecting your brothers, Barger called 911, tipping police to a handgun inside Noel's car. He snitched on his own brothers as a president. Christy fumes, an outlaw didn't dial those three numbers. It's the same as testifying. Sonny had been the model of the wild, unbending outlaw, but living with an informant, beating a 14-year-old girl, calling 911, those were things a Hell's Angel didn't do. And a lot of other members agreed with him putting Sonny Barger in a bad daylight for the whole club. George Christie decided to address this matter in the next meeting. Christie brought the 911 transcription with him, along with the newspaper article offering a description of Barger in what can only be described as a nervous breakdown. Barger was discovered by a neighbor in a state of delusion, completely disconnected from reality, leading to his hospitalization. Contrary to taking action against Barger, the angels pointed fingers at Christie, alleging that he had falsely made the transcripts, and that he was dissing on Barger, causing a lot of tensions and feuds within the Hell's Angels. Barger faced no repercussions for violating the outlaw code. Christie bitterly thinks about Barger, acknowledging his unique hold over the members, especially the more vulnerable Angels. There was an enduring feud between Barger and Christie, set to last until one of them is gone. Christie stated, Sonny and I were done. He couldn't stand being questioned, firmly believing the club was his. Anyone who said otherwise was seen as a threat that had to be dealt with. At 69, Christie sarcastically brushes off 77-year-old Barger, calling him all mystique with no real threat, stating that Sonny lacked a reputation for violence or being physically dangerous. Contrary to this view, Hollywood, law enforcement, and pretty much everyone else would beg to differ. In the glory days, Barger was the fierce face of the angels. When the gang was the most feared on the road and perhaps in the world. As the president of the Ventura, California chapter, Christie gained his own standing within the Angels by quelling the fear stirred by Barger, especially after he established the Oakland chapter in 1958. A former Marine who earned his full patch membership in 1976, Christie took the stage with a reassuring message after Barger lost his voice to throat cancer in 1982. I aim to present the club as a bunch of good guys who valued freedom and just wanted to live life on their terms, he shares. Repeatedly, he emphasized that the Hells Angels love America more than anyone else. 
In a savvy move for public relations, Christie participated in a leg of the Los Angeles Olympic torch relay in the summer of 1984, creating a story that no news outlet could resist. Christie played the role of an honorable outlaw so convincingly that a Ventura County Deputy District Attorney once referred to him as a folk hero. This so-called hero consistently hammered his message home, insisting that while individual angels might engage in criminal activities, the organization itself remained untarnished. Technically, he had a point. Despite federal authorities identifying the Angels as significant methamphetamine suppliers in the 1980s, the club distanced itself by conducting deals through its numerous associates. In 1987, Christie enjoyed the rewards akin to a statesman. While California prisons housed convicted Angels, he managed to walk away from a soliciting murder charge. The FBI approached Christie through informant Michael Mulhern, a high-level member of the Mexican Mafia, offering to eliminate a Ventura chapter member who had cooperated with the feds. Recordings captured Christie stating he would personally carry out the killing, but he later claimed entrapment and conducted himself so effectively in court that he was acquitted. In a move reminiscent of Teflon Don John Gotti, he hosted a backyard barbecue for the jury, further enhancing his reputation as a peace mediator. Hollywood came calling, but Christie's first wife, Cheryl, rejected a movie proposal from filmmaker Michael Mann due to concerns about her portrayal. She also convinced Christie to turn down Diane Keaton's offer for an appearance in her documentary, Heaven. However, Liza Minnelli hosted a celebration for him in Paris when he embarked on one of his international peacekeeping missions. Hell's Angels chapters worldwide were often engaged in conflicts, and Christie's role as a peace whisperer garnered attention. In a heroic tale from the book, an incident unfolded in Steamboat Springs, Colorado, during the 1996 annual USA run, which was a pivotal event for the Angels. Christie was settling in for the night when he received an urgent call. A younger member from Ventura, struggling with meth addiction, had shot two other Angels at the Horse Inn. Upon arrival, Christie found the police surrounding the bar with a formidable presence. Inside, over a hundred angry and armed Angels were in a volatile state. In an effort to prevent a potential catastrophe, the police allowed Christie to enter. Inside, the Angels had the shooter cornered, guns at the ready. After an hour of tense negotiations, Christie managed to convince the bikers to let the shooter leave with him. The Angels created a barrier outside, allowing Christie to escape into the night with the young member on his bike. By 2001, Christie had reached the pinnacle of his influence in the Angels, only to face a harsh blow with a multiple count indictment involving fraud, theft, drug sales, and tax evasion. The sweep rounded up 28 members and associates of the Ventura Angels, with Christie as the primary target. Similar to Sonny Barger, the Ventura County prosecutor wasn't swayed by Christie's reputation as a peacekeeper. Christie spent a year in solitary confinement before striking a deal. Despite the county investing $30 million in the case, Christie walked away with credit for time served. Prison changed him, and he faced a downhill slide after his release. The silver lining was his marriage to Nikki, who had patiently waited for him, with Mickey Rourke dancing at their wedding. However, within a few years, a road accident left him physically impaired, a swindler left him destitute, and rumors circulated that Barger wanted him dead. Life is rarely kind to aging outlaws. In 2010, Christie did something unexpected. He retired from the Hells Angels, respectfully handing over his patch and death head rings at a meeting, hoping for a trouble-free departure. However, the Angels weren't willing to let the old man go quietly. Christie asserts that Barger orchestrated the decision to label him as out bad, no contact, exposing him on Front Street without protection and a target on his back. Perhaps it was a stroke of luck that the feds intervened first. In 2013, Christie ended up in prison, convicted for charges related to the firebombing of two rival tattoo parlors. Christie, featured in the six-part History Channel series Outlaw Chronicles last summer, now expresses pity for Barger. He prefers reminiscing about the good times with a group of brothers riding free and fast, hard against the wind.